Myself and about a dozen young men and women from Guatemala are sitting in the half-light of dusk inside an old barn turned safe house somewhere in the northern part of Chihuahua, Mexico. We've just finished a small dinner of rice and beans as we sorted through documents and reviewed plans for each of their new lives. We've had the same dinner three times in a row. In fact, it's the same thing we've eaten for every meal over the past three days. Now we have nothing left to face but a long journey through the night. Everyone is quiet and anxious, except for me. This is the second time I'm going to cross the Rio Grande this week, and probably close to the hundredth time this year. It's not a big crowd, and luckily on this trip there's no small children to worry about. But still, I can't let my guard down. What if this is the crossing that goes wrong? What if I let down all these people who have put their trust, their faith, and the few dollars they have in my care? Because I am what some people call a coyote, a smuggler, bringing migrants north across the Mexico-US border. Some people may scoff at this lifestyle, but the truth is I am supplying a valuable service for which there is an extremely high demand. I've heard that the business of getting people across the United States southern border is estimated to be a multi-billion dollar industry. There are many dangers and challenges associated with crossing the border. Getting someone to their destination in America both successfully and safely involves a complex understanding of routes and logistics that only those with proven experience possess. If you set out on your own, with no experience, and try to make the same trek that many coyotes do regularly, you'd be dead within a day. Maybe two if you're lucky. As a coyote, I am just one part of a larger network of smugglers, document foragers, business owners, and government conspirators who all work together, each doing our own part to bring migrants across huge distances and without detection. My specific role of leading groups over the actual border, while crucial to the whole system and the role it seems the media focuses on more than any other, is still just one piece of the puzzle. I began work as a coyote just a few years after I myself first came to the United States. I was living in McAllen, Texas, a border town near the Gulf, and working as a day laborer to send money back home to my family in the Mexican state of Oaxaca. I had made trips home and back to Texas a few times at this point, when I was made an offer by the very smuggler I had first paid to bring me into the United States. I had worked many times with this coyote's brother since living in Texas, and he recommended me as someone capable and eager to take on this hard work. The migrant smuggling business was booming, and they needed more guides. I greatly appreciated this offer, as he knew I had been dreaming of a way to make more money, as I was barely making enough to survive on the wages I made as a hired hand, and not nearly as much as I need to be able to support my family back in Mexico. Although I was scared and somewhat skeptical about the new risks that this job would entail, I could not ignore that this was an incredible financial opportunity, and likely the only one that might offer me and my family a chance at a better life. Most people understand that our main service is to escort undocumented migrants into America. Our most used methods of travel include simply trekking by foot, utilizing secret underground tunnels, coming by truck, or a combination of all three. Routes shift regularly, based on the information we receive about where border control is currently applying the most pressure. Routes that have worked for years are suddenly no longer an option after Border Patrol figures out they're regularly used, and coyotes are often forced to go far off the beaten path into the desert to avoid detection, significantly increasing the danger. During my first year in this industry, I simply helped other coyotes work out their routes within Mexico. Our network connects routes through Central America, and there are others that go even further south. But I worked hard, and now I am personally guiding my own groups from this safe house and directly over the border into the US. Depending on the point of origin, the cost of our services can vary from a couple thousand for those covering less distance from Mexico, or to well over $10,000 for those much further south. For many, this is their entire life savings, or even that of their entire family, who all pulled everything that they had to give their son or daughter or nephew a chance. On average, I take groups ranging in size from a large family to a couple dozen. Too many, and it is difficult to manage, but too few is not a good profit. And it isn't just Latin Americans I take. Some people come from even further. Migrants as far away as Africa and Asia make their way to the US via our routes, 
because it is easier for them to find a way into South America than it is to enter North America from their homeland. Everyone risks their lives to make these long and expensive journeys for different reasons, but most of the ones I talk to are trying to escape poverty, violence, persecution, war-torn communities, or even natural disasters. Transportation is not our only service, though. We also provide documents, stolen passports, fake IDs, stolen social security numbers, and other fraudulent documents that can help them greatly once they're finally in America. Sometimes if the picture on a stolen ID matches our client well enough, they can even be smuggled through official border crossings. But this is rare. And though it's by far the easiest path into America, it carries its own risk when you walk into a building full of border agents. We can also connect migrants with business owners in the states that are looking for employees, willing to look the other way, and eager for more affordable labor. We even bribe government workers on both sides of the border. But the most crucial task we must absolutely do is off the drug cartels. They are the ones truly in control of the border, and not paying them would result in death. Personally, I treat my clients with the utmost respect, taking even more special care with the elderly, the young, and the female migrants. They are the most vulnerable to assault and abuse along the route. For me to allow women and children harm would not only tarnish my business reputation as a reputable coyote, but it would also create situations that could jeopardize my control and safe management of each group I transport. Still, neglect and abuse coyotes do exist. After all, the people making this journey are desperate. Hostage situations, extortion, and abuse, or all kinds are just some of the many risks people take on when immigrating and when working with coyotes. Sadly, many don't realize this until they are already in a bad situation, but can't turn back and are forced to continue this harsh journey. Some coyotes are just con artists, having migrants pay thousands up front early on the journey, only to never even make it across Mexico. Generally, migrants pay us in stages along the way. Mostly, I spend time telling the groups I lead how imperative it is that they remain silent, extremely silent, and to be prepared to stay still and wait for up to several hours in uncomfortable outdoor conditions. When you've just spent weeks being cold, tired, hungry, or scared, it can be difficult to keep yourself under control like this. The truth of the matter, though, is if we are caught, there are, in reality, not that many negative consequences. Clients are instructed to never, ever reveal who their coyote was. It would do them no benefit to identify us anyway. It's not like they would be granted citizenship just for cooperating. And it is always the same result. They are detained or deported. However, if I was caught, well, I can simply pose as a regular migrant. Just another one of the group who paid some other coyote to bring me across the border. And no, I don't know what they look like or even what their name is. It is extremely unlikely that I would be charged with a serious crime, and I would likely just be deported. This is what makes migrant smuggling so much more appealing than trafficking drugs or weapons. Though many other people and organizations moving migrants are involved in these markets as well. Still, it is a lucrative business, but I must remember that the truth is, those I work with are criminals. I have to remind myself to be alert and ready to defend myself as, in a way, I am putting myself at risk by association. And of course, one never knows what kind of people my clients are. There's a chance that they too are criminals or violent. At the very least, I know that they are desperate and that for this brief period, my being alive is the only thing that will help them make it. After all, I too am desperate. As my group makes their way in the dark, perfectly silent, just as instructed, I still feel a rush of adrenaline just like I did the very first time I crossed the border. Maybe this is because the routes change every time. It always feels different. Or maybe the nerves just never fully go away. The weight of the night gets to you on these silent walks. Even though it's not likely, I've always feared that right before we cross, someone, perhaps people from the cartel who have a debt to collect, or even law enforcement officers, would emerge from this darkness and surprise us with an attack ending my life. Would my family ever find out what happened to me? The money that this job has given me is what I always dreamed of, and now my family even resides with me in Texas. But at this point, I probably have enough financial security to quit and continue with my life in America by doing more honest work. After being poor for most of my life, I am only just now starting to accept that maybe I don't need to take these risky trips so often. 
Now I also worry that the consequences of my actions will become more severe in today's shifting political climate. Once we make it across the river, this time we floated on a set of old tires lashed together like a raft, much more awkward than some of the inflatable boats we use. I can suddenly feel the excitement among the other travelers. I can sense it even in the dark quiet. The journey is not over, but for these people who have come so far, the anticipation and hope is overflowing. From here, we will trek to a meeting place where an American trucker will drive us to a safe house at a Texas cattle ranch. I look around at their faces shining in the moonlight. The grueling walks, the lack of sleep, the meager amounts of food. I can read in their smiling eyes that it all has been worth it for them. All the thoughts I had about quitting this week have vanished from my mind. The mood is too hopeful now.